的声听，为此发挥集一切众生，请转妙法轮，教导我们如何了生脱死。素正无声。Well, the Sangha with great virtue, out of compassion, for the sake of this assembly and all living beings, please turn the wonderful Dharma wheel to teach us. How to leave suffering and attain bliss and endless embers and quickly realize numbers. Namu Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa. Namu Tassa Bhagavato. Arahato Sama Sanputasa. Homage to the blessed, noble, and perfectly enlightened one. To the blessed, noble, and perfectly enlightened one. Namo Sadanto Suchedo Ye Olahudi Samyao Sanputoshe. Namo Sadanto Suchedo Ye Olahudi Samyao Sanputoshe. Okay, together, everybody. Wu Shang Shen Shen Wei Miao Fa, Bai Qin Wan Jie Nan Zao Yu. I Jin Wen Wan Er Shou Shi Yuan Ye Ru Lai Zhen Shi Yi. Together, supreme and wondrous Dharma, subtle and profound, rarely is encountered even in billions of eons. But now we hear and see it and accept it deliberately. May we truly understand the Buddha's actual meaning. Venerable Master, Dhamma friends, good afternoon, everybody. Good evening. <coughs> My name is Hung Shur. I'm here in Queensland, Australia, Gold Coast Dhamma realm. It is Sunday, February 16th. For those of you sitting in the Buddha Hall at the Berkeley Buddhist Monastery, it's yesterday. It's Saturday, February 15th in the evening, and uh, we're going to be investigating together, no matter what day it is, we're going to be investigating the Flower Garland Sutra, the Ten Stages chapter. So let's get started. Here's our text. This is, we invoke spiritual presence by chanting the name of the Flower Garland Assembly and the Buddhists and the Buddhists next to us. Melody, here we go. Namo da fang guang fu, a yen ji, a yen hai hui, o pu sa. Oh. 
to move ahead now into our text and today's section begins right at the bottom of page 12 the last paragraph. I didn't mention to welcome all of you who are joining online. Our, that has become our second largest audience, I might add. The first largest audience is now happening in China. Uh, courtesy of our Translation staff, volunteers who keep my comments translated into Mandarin and broadcast uh, into China. The second largest audience is on YouTube, uh, listening in. And since I'm coming to a screen in the Berkeley Buddhist Monastery, uh, instead of flesh and blood lecture, What's the diff, right? What's the difference if you're watching at home on the screen or watching at the monastery? Well, there is a difference. I will say what difference there is. Um, the monastery is the place where I first heard the name of the Flower Garland Sutra. And oh my goodness, uh, when Master Hua would uh, do what we just did, which is uh, lead us in invoking spiritual presence to you, you definitely had the feeling the Garland Assembly of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas were uh, descending and illuminating and shining up the place simply because um, it's, uh, it's what they're waiting for. I can't speak for them, but certainly uh, when people with a sincere heart and key is rufa, according to the Dharma, invoke these practices, there's uh, a response, they say. Now, today's topic is that it's um, uh, still with the realm of cause and effect, but this is what you call sheng yin, and you get sheng guo. Can't, can't hear? Got to be louder. I'll be louder. For you in the back row. Okay. Got it. Thank you for the feedback. Okay. Here we are. We're going to start with Fordzi, and we have to. <coughs> um, let's just do. Let's do this much right here, and that'll be. That'll correspond to the first chunk. Okay, ready? So it's just the first two lines. Here we go. You want to read with me? Yeah, Cherry. Um, sorry, can you check your microphone if it's using the correct mic? Because uh, we're hearing a lot, quite a bit of noise. You're hearing a lot of noise. That is, in fact, okay. In that case, let me do this. It's a lot better. Directly. Okay better directly into the computer that should be better I was running it through a USB hub before it's still kind of noisy okay really still kind of noisy no kidding this is the Yeti 
All right. Is that uh, one being chosen as the audio hmm, input on the Zoom device? Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah, it is. Now I could. This is the. This is my standard onboard Macintosh lap, uh, mic, laptop mic. Is that any better? Yeah, that's a lot better. Seriously? Oh, that's too bad. Or good for Apple, one or the other. Pick your response. <laughs> okay. Well, we're just, this is nice. We're getting rid of technology as we go. We're shedding devices. That's good. Okay. Uh, next, you're going to say, uh, turn off that light, Dharma Master. That light is shining in your face. This lecture has been pre-recorded and it's being brought to you by. So let's begin here. And I'm going to put my palms together and invite folks to do the same. Here we go. Let's do it in unison, right? Not call and response. 佛子此大菩萨并其卷数坐华坐实所有光明其一言音普皆充满十方法界 English right here, this first paragraph. Disciples of the Buddha, when this big Bodhisattva and his followers sit on their floral thrones, their lights and their voices extend and fill up the Dharma realms of the ten directions. Uh, this big Bodhisattva, that might sound strange. This, is, he, is he overweight? Is he eight feet tall what's big about the bodhisattva the answer could be everything is big about the bodhisattva um we tend to overuse the word great when we translate so the attempt it's a tapusa uh, another a more elegant a more fitting word would be um when this major bodhisattva the significant bodhisattva this awesome mm, what's big about him is his uh his, his or her heart, vows, practices, and status among bodhisattvas, seniority perhaps, um, all of those things could contribute to his bigness. So we don't want to interpret that as meaning this is a, uh, a huge bodhisattva physically. It may be so, it might be imposing, or he could be four feet tall, four or five, something like that. Uh, in any case, the bodhisattva's presence is large and big. Um, probably vows and practices are the criteria that make the most sense in the Avatamsaka realm. So what happens? We have, let me back up for those of you who are wondering what's going on. We are in the middle of the Flower Garland Sutra. We're past the middle. The topic of the sutra is the bodhisattva and his or her practices. And we're in a chapter known as the 10 stages chapter. And in this chapter, there are 10 classes, 10, that's to say like classes in the classroom. There are 10 sets of instructions that uh, our bodhisattva paradigm, our uh, sample bodhisattva, what's the word I'm looking for? Our exemplar, our model bodhisattva is um, undergoing this instruction. He's enrolled in the school and he's learning how to be uh, a more thoroughgoing bodhisattva right up to the point of Buddhahood, whether or not he or she goes to Buddhahood is, I think, probably not a question they're asking. But <clears throat> should that be the case, they're on the path, they're on the way. The instructions of each stage, of which there are 10, are progressive. He learns more, and then he learns more, and then he learns more, and then he learns more. And each of the levels, of instruction contribute to his or her ability to do the work of bodhisattvas, which is teaching living beings how to wake up, teaching us how to get past our hangups, troubles, afflictions, 
knots that we tie in our minds out of empty space and how to untie those knots. That's the work of the Bodhisattva. And these instructions are um, geared to that point. The things that happen to the Bodhisattva on the way, just to say the transformation of discriminating consciousness to um, transcendent wisdom, that mental change, uh, are they can seem to be outrageous. They can seem to be unscientific, unprovable. And yet, um, if you think of the nature of the text, this is a 2,500 year old text minimum, if we use the standard Buddhist history to judge. And when it was spoken, this particular text, according to the tradition, was spoken immediately upon awakening by the Buddha. First thing he did under the Bodhi tree when he woke up was say, wow, look at what I see. This is what's evident to me through my newly awakened vision, far out, or oh my goodness, or something like that. And the, the centuries and centuries and centuries of Chinese scholars in robes who look at this text all said the same thing, that this is somewhat like, they said, uh, unprocessed milk straight from the cow. We're, we live in a time of pasteurized, homogenized, 1%, you know, lacked aid. Uh, <laughs> we're, we live in, actually, the truth be told, we live in a time of almond milk and oat milk. That's what we're, we're you know, grain milks, grain drinks, not cow's milk, dairy milk. But the Chinese, even though they didn't have access to lots of milk, the Indians certainly did. Um, and the Indian scholars... Uh, created this, vision, this uh, metaphor of the Avatamsaka Sutra, among the other sutras, being milk right from the cow, untouched, full of butter fat, full of, you know, strains of hay from where the cow was milked, things like that, really raw and unprocessed. So the Avatamsaka Sutra is the Buddha's first vision through his newly awakened wisdom eyes of the world. And it's full of that. It's got all kinds of chapters about bodhisattvas appearing and where the bodhisattvas live and what they look like and how worlds come into being. There's all of those chapters in the beginning before the bodhisattva's instructions begin. Well, today we are at the peak of those instructions. We're at the 10th stage out of 10. And the 10 stages is said to be the exemplar. This is the hallmark uh, Bodhisattva path instruction. Now, in the 10th stage, where are we? Our Bodhisattva has been praised by, actually the Buddhas who were giving the instructions are praised by devas. The gods come and sing their praises. That was far out. Then our Bodhisattva reviews everything he's learned so far from first stage to the ninth stage. And what that wisdom, knowledge, information, techniques, kung fu, what all that allows him or her to do <clears throat> at this point in preparation for the next lesson. And last week, uh, let's see. The, the thing that happened prior to what happened last week was samadhi. Our bodhisattva enters 10 major samadhis and masters that meditation skill. So the sutra talks about really good meditators and what, what they're able to do at this point when they, what, what do you say, what's the go within? When they cross their legs, they don't have to cross their legs to meditate. They can do it while walking, while standing, while sitting, while lying down. But they meditate. They put their mind in that state called Zheng Ding Zheng Shou, right? Right focus, stillness, and right holding on. Right 
integration. I kind of, I think integration might be good for show. Right, merging with body. They say in Chinese, shen xin xin ming, your body, your mind, your nature, and your life merges with the flow of karma from your purified sense organs, you know, and it's samadhi. You just, you enter this state of integration. So that happened. What happened next? Suddenly a lotus flower. Oh my goodness. We had a week of this amazing, amazing lotus flower appearing suddenly. And the sutra took its time to describe this lotus flower and what it was like. And it described it in loving detail, every aspect of the lotus. And uh, last week we finished with the Bodhisattva taking a seat on the lotus throne. And it said all of his major and minor hallmarks merged with the lotus's appearance, the way you describe it, like perfect fit. And bodhisattvas in huge numbers on all sides, each sat on lotus flowers. So we have our major bodhisattva surrounded by many, many other bodhisattvas sitting on their, their flowers. And I remember last week, right at this point, I was preparing everybody to enjoy the state and our internet went down. Oh, what an encounter, anticlimax. It was, I felt uh, like my buildup had come to naught. So that's what happened last week. And the bodhisattvas sitting on their minor lotuses look up at the big bodhisattva sitting on his major lotus. And it says, each of them attain hundreds of thousands of samadhis and they gaze up at the bodhisattva single-mindedly. Okay, brings us to today. This is here where we are today. What's going on next? Watch. When the bodhisattvas sit in their thrones, their lights and their voices extend and fill up the Dharma realms of the Ten Directions. So this is remarkable, right? We have something coming out of the bodhisattvas, uh, light and sound. The French say le son et la lumière, meaning uh, the show, <coughs> the, the, the hubbub, the, the entertainment, the excitement, the sound and the light coming out of the bodhisattvas. Because why? What's going on? Well, they know there's dharma about to flow. The teachings are on their way, and they're in the process of bringing the dharma of the 10 stages down now. And that for them is a cause of celebration. The, um, here you have former, former people, current people, not only people, but humans, other beings as well, who before they started to practice the Bodhisattva path, before they changed their diet, changed their habits, picked up the precepts, took refuge, got a teacher, got a community, changed their, their schedules to allow them to meditate and to bow, etc. Before they set foot on the traditional path of cultivation, they were normal folks, ordinary people. But after they started their practice of cultivation, bit by bit, their values changed and they instead of accumulating material wealth for example uh, began to practice generosity and had enough to get by but they're pretty soon their outgo surpassed their income and they were more joyous than before that's a sample of the kind of values right they got so happy from the giving they did that they found this inexhaustible source of happiness, which was generosity. That's, they say, the first practice cultivated by all Buddhas is 布施, right? Generosity, giving. So 
other things changed, right? Bad habits they gave up, things that didn't help the body like alcohol and tobacco, things like that. They let go of, not because someone told them, not because they were abusing themselves or making themselves unhappy, the opposite. The, the more they found of their, what do you say, their fundamental identity, the happier they became. And so bit by bit by bit, their values changed. And the values that arise spontaneously from somebody who is pursuing this path seem to be pretty much the opposite of marketplace values. And Master Hua, our founder, his um, list of six items the, uh, what do you call it, the six guidelines? If somebody puts their heart into the six guidelines, they will definitely go bust as businessmen. They are not marketplace values, right? If you follow this, his guidelines, you say, oh, we don't contend, we yield. So you have a better product, you can take it, right? No thing. We don't greed, we don't want to progress that way in sales, you know, in profits, and you're going to go broke, right? We don't seek, we're, we're not selfish, we don't, all of the, and we don't lie. So we don't pursue personal advantage. So those are the six, and the marketplace is founded on contention and greed and growth, the myth of eternal progress that Greta Thunberg so, so eloquently pointed to, this, this fantasy that in a finite system, you can consume infinitely. That infinite growth is a, is a good thing in a closed system like our planet Earth. So anyway, just to say that what happens is people on the Bodhisattva path start to focus on two things in particular that keep popping up. One is practices and one is vows. And why is that? Why would that? Why would those two things be, be so important? And my answer to that question that I asked myself: Why? Why are those? For example, Samatabhadras, practices and vows, is the key chapter to this entire sutra. I think it's because the the more this identity with the self recedes inside you the less important pleasing this illusory self inside, the more that lightens in my life, it's replaced by a wish to bring that same well-being to others. The more the self recedes, the more the bodhisattva feels connected to other beings. One day I asked Master Hua, I said, Shurfu, what is the highest state? I expected to be scolded because that's the kind of, you know, fishing question that he would, what are you false thinking about? You, is that your highest? That's your state? Is that, you think you have the highest? He, sometimes he would slam you for, for what is called false thinking that way. That day he didn't. I said, Shurfu, what is the highest state? He said, Tongti Dabe. Great compassion where you share the same body with all living beings. That's the highest thing. Now, on another day, he might have answered, no affliction. That's another answer that I heard him give. But on that day, it was great compassion where you share a single body. Tong ti, same body, great compassion. And I thought about that, and it's like, why would that be the high? I thought like nirvana would be the highest state or, you know, liberation or enlightenment would be the highest state. Not according to Master Hua. He said, Tongti Dabe. Just four words was his answer. And reflecting on that, it was like, what is that? It's, as I see it, it's bittersweet because why? 
other beings' misery is yours. You share all the misery of living beings, but you have something to do about it. You've got a method to transform it. If you think about Guanyin Bodhisattva, for example, who, according to the stories, was a Buddha already, but then noticed how living beings' suffering hadn't diminished all that much, and said, I can't just attain nirvana for myself, I have to get involved. So came back as a bodhisattva. Guanyin came back with a thousand hands and a thousand eyes and a thousand ears. And they say, yo chiu bi ying, right? No matter what request is made, Guanyin will respond. Right? Shun sheng chiu ku. Guanyin bodhisattva hears sounds and goes to save them from suffering. Doesn't feel it, feels it. So when you have tong ti dabe, it must hurt like mad, but you're not clueless and powerless to respond. I think that has something to do with why that's the highest state. And the self is gone. So number one, I guess you're never hung up. Number two, you never, you never have your own worries. You have everyone else's worries. So it's a bittersweet state. And um, I don't think that the Bodhisattva path is a free lunch. It is not blissful. I think it's hard work from what I watch and observe. But uh, just by having that tong ti, same body, what must it be like? You're never lost. You're never not at home. You're never alone. You're never not with family because there's no one who is not your family, including the Eastern brown snake that Ben saw sliding across the path 20 minutes ago, heading for the pond, looking for frogs, right? Second most venomous animal on the planet. Here is a common thing in Australia. <laughs> That's just about 100 yards down the road here. Oh my goodness. So yeah, even brown snakes. For the brown snake, that's their life, you know, and they're perfectly in possession of their life as uh, despised as snakes are by other beings, right? So the same with mosquitoes, the same with birds and microbes. So tong ti, what would that mean? So here are these bodhisattvas able now to hear the Dharma on their lotus as they're ready, they're thrilled because Vajra Treasury Bodhisattva is about to teach them how to fulfill those practices and vows better than ever. When they hear the Dharma, their ability to save beings grows. They get better at what they do when they hear the Dharma. They're in school. Bodhisattvas are there to study and learn from an expert how a 10 stage bodhisattva does the work of saving living beings. Now, um, what would it mean to save living beings? One of my favorite stories is uh, uh, I, I won't mention his name, he's a, a friend of many of us in the Bay Area. Uh, he was smarty, smart guy, really bright, and had strong good roots. And somebody told him that there was a Buddhist master teaching at Gold Mountain Monastery in San Francisco. And this guy was Jewish, and his dad was a kosher butcher. He killed animals. Uh, According to the Talmud, is it the Talmud that gives us the rules or the, the, the Mishnah? There, there are specific rules for how to do kosher butchers, you know, and they're, they're, they're passed on from tradition. The young man was a vegetarian. He wanted to move his father out of the butcher business. And he was, uh, when I say he was smart, he 
he was smart and he knew he was smart. And so he tended to, to talk back a lot. So I was there when he came in on a Saturday and somebody introduced me and I showed him where to sit to listen to the lecture. And uh, after the lecture, Master Hua says, anybody have any questions? And uh, this new guy, right? First time in the monastery, he raises his hand. And he says, yeah, he says, you know, I hear about this, uh, this bodhisattvas. He says, why would anybody want to do what they do? And he was mocking in his tone. And Master Hua looked at him. And everybody's kind of like, <gasps> you know, what an impertinent, rude thing to say. And Master Hua looked, just looked at him and he said, well, for one, he said, a bodhisattva would know exactly the words to use to talk to their father to get him to give up his bad habits, he said. And this, this young man is like, he, he never met Master Hua, never spoken a word to him before. Sherpa said he would know exactly what to say to his father to get him to give up his bad habits. And the young man was like, oh, is that right? You know, huh. So he stayed after lecture and six months later left home and became a monk. So to be able to do that, you know, uh, it's why these bodhisattvas are all excited about being able to sit down on their lotus to hear the Dharma that is coming. The 10th stage is about to be spoken. Oh, they're excited. Okay, next line of the text. Every world system whatsoever experiences quaking. That's it. Um, oh, by the way, uh, I, I realize I didn't explain this extending of lights and voices. Um, what, how I make sense of that is that at a certain point, bodhisattvas um, have their affinities with certain living beings in certain worlds. Um, the Samantabhadra's Practices and Vows, that chapter 40, talks about how when you're in the, the Bodhisattva Academy, which is the Pure Land, um, you learn what you're learning is how to teach. And when the, your conditions are right, you come down in a certain world, in a certain place, and the living beings with whom you have affinities, you, you're there to start to teach them. Right? So each of the, you could say, all of these bodhisattvas here um, on their lotuses are kind of here for a trade show. No, that's too crude. What is it? It's a work vacation. They're here in the, our world, ready to listen to the Avatamsaka Sutra. But when they're done, they're going back to their worlds to teach those beings with whom they have sort of a contract to teach, take them across no matter how long it required. So sitting on their lotuses, getting ready to hear the Dharma, they are sending out their, what? Their broadcast to the worlds and the Dharma realms where those beings are, um, are in the future going to be taught by them. How do they do it? Well, I would have to be one to tell you, and I'm not, but I have a hunch. What's it like when you transfer merit? When we transfer merit, as we do at the end, may every living being, right? We're sending our minds out to wherever you send them to whatever world, to whatever individual, to whatever Dharma realm. Um, you're transferring for your future Fogo, your future Buddha land, right? It's being made by the merit you transfer out. Oh. 
Buddhists. <coughs> so could it be that these bodhisattvas, because of the purity of their minds, when they send out their thoughts to those worlds where they're going to be teaching, it manifests as light and sound, right? They're, those beings maybe don't hear what the bodhisattvas are hearing. They still get the broadcast. The mind is the most powerful thing in the world. So, and these minds are surpassingly wonderful minds. Okay, maybe, something like that. That's where my thoughts go. Jin Chuan, Jin Fu, Jin He Shi, Jin Wei Shi. If any of you have ideas about how these miracles today are happening, please chime in. Because this is, today's text is pretty miraculous, let's say. For example, every world system whatsoever experiences quaking. Okay. The, um, this is part of Buddhist cosmology. What does it say? It says, Da di liu zhong, zhen dong. The earth quakes in six ways. Now, this is a fairly common um, concept that pops up in the sutras. They say when something very good, capital G, you know, chun shan, shan liang, when something really wonderfully wholesome happens, nature responds. What is this? This is nature, world system, responding to something that people are doing. They're bodhisattva people, but they're people. Tian, Di, and heaven, earth, and humanity are related in, 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 inextricably. They're all related, right? And when humans do something really good, says this cosmology, says the system, it's reflected in the environment that we create. The goodness being done here is the Dharma wheel is about to turn with the Abhatamsaka Dharma of the 10 stages. <clears throat> That's wholesome. That's called Sheng Yinguo, sublime cause and effect. And it brings about a Sheng Guo, a sublime response. The six kinds of earthquakes, they say, break down into three movements and three sounds. There's Zhen, Bian Zhen, Zheng Bian Zhen. There's Ho. Bian Ho, Zhang Bian Ho, things like that. There's shaking, there's multiple shaking, there's incredible multiple shaking, <laughs> sort of like that. And then there's sound, roaring and shaking. So it's earthquakes, but they say nobody gets hurt. They're not destructive kinds of earthquakes. So, okay, now somebody could hear that and say, yeah, I'm not that gullible, you know, prove it. Where have we seen it? Well, come on. Um, there's all kinds of, of uh, realities happening that are un inaccessible to our current six senses. For example, the fact that wirelessly, all I have to do is pick up my phone and tap a couple buttons and I can have someone's voice coming to my phone and I can have a phone call. It's just on another wavelength. Where did it come from? Well, it, invisibly it came through my phone because I had a radio that was there to pick up those for that particular bandwidth. Okay, there's what? Infrared light, there's ultraviolet light. We can't do without it, but we can't see it. Dogs can hear sounds that we can't hear. So we shouldn't measure reality by relatively limited capacity of our six senses. Unless, unless what? Unless we transform them and follow the Buddha who became a massive scientist uh, simply by working on his own laboratory of body and mind. So, not happening. Earth is not quaking. Mm, I'm not gonna say yes, I'm not gonna say no, certainly. I will suspend my judgment and learn more about it. The sutras, I'll talk about it. How interesting. Could heaven and earth be so happy 
that they spontaneously shake in appreciation. Hmm. Interesting. What else happens? Wow. The evil destinies subside and all lands become magnificent. All bodhisattvas of like practice, without exception, gather together. Music played by the gods and humans arises together, and all beings feel peaceful and joyful as they present offerings of inconceivably many gifts. This scenario transpires in the assembly of every group. Okay. So this is uh, what happens when the bodhisattva enters samadhi, the lotus appears, he sits upon it, his gathering of bodhisattvas, his retinue, his crowd, follow suit. They also sit on their lotuses. And this is the preamble to the Dharma being taught. It would be... This would be very cinematic, wouldn't it? If you could make a movie of this, we'd, we'd all go, oh, oh, I get it. I get it. We've seen that in movies. Hmm. Because we haven't, nobody has made a, uh, a, an animation, even an anime. Uh, Hayao Miyazaki has never drawn a Buddha land, as far as I know. Maybe now that he's retired from Studio Ghibli, maybe he could. I don't know if Miyazaki is a Buddhist. That would be great. If we could get him to illustrate this, this scene from the Avatamsaka. Call it the preamble to the, to the turning of the Dharma wheel, right? The pre-lecture. What happens when the 10th stage is about to be explained? Uh, these are miraculous things, right? Bodhisattvas sit on, the lotus appears. Bodhisattvas take a seat. Lights are emitted, sounds come forth, the earth quakes, evil destinies subsides, so the hells, the animals, the ghosts, which are what? Realities made by the human mind, they get bright, they stop. Right? People's mind, if we use an inner reality as the cause of these outer manifestations, then what's happening is goodness is prevailing. I think I'm not wrong by saying that every single thing explained here, every aspect of this story is simply a reflection of a purified human mind. I'm not wrong. Wonderful, marvelous, evil destinies, the hell is quit, right? The ghosts all embody or reach nirvana, right? All lands become magnificent. All of this is began with an inner reality that then manifests as an outer side. I think that's a safe statement to make. So every bit of this is describing something attainable by you, by me, by anyone who follows this these practices and does the work of cultivation. <coughs> the next thing that happens is what? I like the idea of Tong Hang Pusa, bodhisattvas of like practice, mm, fellow cultivators, fellow meditators, fellow devotees, fellow dharma, uh, karma yogis, right? fellow translators, fellow illustrators, fellow cooks, and laborers, people who protect the Dharma, people who landscape monasteries, right? All of these bodhisattvas of like practice come together because they're about to celebrate something truly wonderful. 
the teaching of the Dharma. Okay, it specifies that, what does the Chinese say? It says, Ren Tian Yin Yue, Tong Shi Ba Sheng. Music played by gods and humans arises together. Oh boy. I've, uh, I've often wondered what divine music would sound like. Um, there is, there is the composition music of the spheres. Who is the, oh shoot, I should look it up. Who is, there's a composer. Who, um, anybody know? I'm not going to put anybody on the spot. Maybe somebody online can type into the chat box and Jerry can report. Who, who wrote music of the spheres where you have the planet Jupiter, the planet Mars? That's, who is it? This is the $64,000 question. The clock is ticking. Somebody will know. There's a Horst, H-O-R-S-T. I get the prize. H-O-R-S-T, he's a European composer. European or American? Anyway, music he plays, there's Venus, there's Mars, there's Jupiter, there's Saturn. Wonderful celestial music. And um, was it Copernicus who said he could actually hear the actual sounds of the planets, the vibrations the planets make? So what would God's music sound like? Some people would say, oh, no doubt, it's Johann Sebastian Bach. <laughs> Like that. Um, some people would say it's the voice of a lyric soprano. Uh, I was listening before I came over to one of my very, 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 very favorite composers, Lorena McKennett. Uh, Canadian composer and humanitarian um, and looking at some of the comments on uh, some of my favorite tunes that she has composed and recorded and performed and the comments were from all over the world because Lorena is she's maybe better known in Europe and the Middle East than she is in, in America Ken. they were saying surely this is the voice of a of someone beyond human. Her soprano is so pure and it, it inspires, it invokes um, a response in the listener that is not emotional. It's beyond emotion. It's a kind of, I want to follow this voice home. You know, wherever that voice goes, that's where I want to be, sort of thing. Not, not in a romantic way, in a belonging. We belong to that voice. It's that on pitch and evocative. And these are her compositions. You know? So what a remarkable musical spirit and what a contribution uh, someone, a, a, a composer and performer like that could make to the world to bring people together. So music played by gods and humans arises together. How would that sound? How sublime that would be. Not cacophony, not uh, disturbing at all, but harmonizing. So that all beings feel peaceful and joyful as they what? As they present offerings of inconceivably many gifts to the Buddha. What do they do? So it specifies that the things that they offer to the Buddha are beyond conceiving. You can't Think of how many they are. And, excuse me, these are, who's doing this? This is people who what? Why would you do this? It's not to please the Buddha. It's that when these lights, when these sounds, when the earth shakes, when you see a fellow bodhisattva showing up to be with you, there is a turning of the heart towards goodness. I suspect people feel so happy they can't contain it. And the feeling is, I want to extend myself to create a relationship with the source of goodness, the Buddha, by just giving something. 
And what does the Buddha accept from living beings? Things like, if I were to turn this computer so you could see the altar, or you there sitting in Berkeley, look, just look at the altar. Those traditionally are the very, very things that always come up as appropriate offerings. Things like flowers, things like light, lamps, things like fragrance, incense, things like food, or water, or garments, things like that. Things that anyone can offer that can reflect your wish to create a relationship with the Buddha of something you value giving, being given to the Buddha. So that the Buddha goes, ah, good indeed. I accept your offering. You have merit and virtue. Those are the gifts, right? Not the many things that people could give to the, to the Buddhas, but don't. I remember in Indonesia, I was there following Master Shrinhua, and uh, we were walking through Jakarta, and somebody was showing us the, the rich, incredibly rich diversity of, of uh, races, and creeds, and communities in Jakarta. It is truly, truly an international city. And there was a temple, and we, we walked in, and we thought, oh, this is a good Buddhist place. And our host, who was down the street talking to somebody, came running up and said, um, uh, no, you know, probably not, not what you think. And what was it? It was San Bao Jiao. San Bao Jiao is the, the treasure, the teaching of the three treasures. And it's got uh, the Buddha and Lao Tzu and Confucius all on the altar. And I think Jesus was on the corner. And on the altar was alcohol and a duck, a plucked roasted duck. <laughs> and we're like, now, I've never seen that before. I've never seen a plucked, roasted, braised duck on the altar, all, you know, with his beak there. And, 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 and Baijiu, you know, a big bottle of, of uh, I think it might have been sake, you know, rice wine. And it was, as me, I, I grew up Methodist, where you don't put stuff on the altar like that. But then when I encountered Buddhism, I learned that you, your offerings should accord with harmlessness and sobriety. So we seeing the, the meat and the alcohol on the altar was like, oh, I'm not, I'm in somebody else's church, you know. So we he said, yeah, this is Sambao Jia. So that's okay. That's no no comment on Sambao Jia. It's just that I was not used to seeing, you know, meat and alcohol. So for sure, for sure, if you read the sutras, you discover that the things that these bodhisattvas are offering all, number one, came from nature. Number two, anybody can. Those offerings are not limited to wealthy people's offerings. And just like the parable of the widow's might in the Bible, um, where the, uh, the widow with her tiny offering which amounts to everything she can afford is the offering that gets praise compared to the, the wealthy person's cartloads of similar offerings that gets no favor because it represents very little of the wealthy person's wealth, but it was all of the widow's wealth. That very same story is told in, in the Buddha's lifetime of paying attention to the person who is sincere with their offering. It's the heart behind it, not the object itself that matters. So inconceivably many gifts to the Buddhas. Um, talk about, talks about that. And if you, if you went into it, what would you see? You would see crowds of people, crowds of people all in an orderly way, wanting to get close to the altar so that they could put their offerings down. And 
bow respectfully and then sit down and feel like they've taken a piece of their lives to tie it up together with the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha because they feel like there's goodness coming. And the environment, okay, the scenario transpires in the assembly of every Buddha. The environment being created here before the lecture begins is tremendously wholesome. There's just goodness going on here. There are, <coughs> excuse me, trouble with my throat today. There are descriptions of the Buddha uh, appearing and what it felt like. What did it feel like when you're face to face with the Buddha? And people tried to put it into, uh, into language. And they say, what was it like? You lose your doubts. You lose your fears. Every shadowy corner of your mind goes away. You just feel at home. You feel like you can bathe in the light. There's just this sense of, I'm, the Buddha sees every single bit of me and I'm happy. I'm not trying to cover over at all. I let that go long ago. I just want my goodness to emerge fully from my mind. Here's my chance, right? What's going on? I think what's going on here is that um, when you come face to face with somebody who has removed the coverings from their nature, that's what it feels like. This is a human being whose mind is not covered by rooming anymore. No more ignorance. It's all transformed. And face to face with that person, you just feel good, energized, wholesome, inspired, lighted, lit up, right? And so much so that this influence of this one individual lasts, they say, the Zheng Fa Shidai lasts for hundreds of years. And even talking, if you're close to the, the time of the Buddha, even... Uh, talking about him is enough to allow people to let go of their coverings and feel that light. So imagine if that was your life, if your life was so influential on people that, you know, hundreds of years later, just mentioning you and what you did was able, was enough to make people, boom, wake up. Neat. You'd have to be pretty selfless, but there was no, nothing added except the goodness of your cultivation to make that happen. Okay. Um, so I'll give you a preview. The next thing that happens is lights. Uh, we have 10 fang guang mi. 10 episodes, the Bodhisattva, this is Vajra Treasury, after he sits down, lights start to emerge. And they, it covers from the bottom of his body all the way up to the top of his body. In 10 different places, lights shine forth and different parts of the world receive that light. So that's coming up next. And it's really powerful. And we'll be, I think I'll try to get through it in one week because there's a lot the same, but it talks about the 10 Dharma realms, the six realms on the, in samsara, on rebirth, and then the four realms that are, there's the liu, fan, and the si, sheng the six ordinary realms, like where we are, and then the four realms of sages that have already gone beyond samsara. And the lights go to different places. So this is truly, clearly, not something I read about in my physics textbook. Not something that biology teaches teach you. 
but um, for the Avatamsaka, this is standard bodhisattva practice to Feng Guangmi before the sutra is about to be explained. So we're going to get there next. Kind of astonishing. <clears throat> and you heard it here, right? This is part of the Flower Garden Sutra. So um, I've said this, this before, but it bears saying again. Um, people wonder, what is it like to be in the presence of someone like this? And my first answer is, I don't know. And Master Hua would not want us to say he's a bodhisattva. That's not, he, didn't, he didn't say that stuff about him. Uh, he would say, how do you know? Are you, it takes one to know one. Are you a bodhisattva to know one? So he was very much interested in puncturing pretense for people claiming they knew who he was. However, my observation was around Master Hua, there was a feeling of being in the presence of somebody whose nature was uncovered, if, I, if that makes any sense. That's just language that I'll use to describe it. It's like if you stood next to him regularly, there was a feeling of getting sunburned. <laughs> uh, he was so intensely human. So underscore alive and awake, you know, underline, 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 that being around him, you, you felt like he was shining on you in places that maybe you didn't want anybody to look at. You know? He was, uh, it was impossible to hide from Master Watt. He would just, just sitting there, and he, what would he be doing smiling? Just, just as kind as could be. Um, my own mother, bless her heart, Debbie Metcalf, uh, before she actually met Master Hua, was sure that he had put LSD in my teacup. Otherwise, why would her son have behaved in the ways he did? There was no way to explain it. She was afraid of him. She thought he might be some guru cult master, right? When she met him, she absolutely was fascinated by him. She wanted to know, how, how does he, he seems to have a, a something, like you call it wisdom? She would say, what is, he's got it, whatever that is. And it took one conversation with Master Hua. My mother had, was a, uh, you know, a, a open mind. She had, he was interested in the world around her. She met him and she said, I, it's okay. You can keep your silence vow. Don't, don't, don't change it. But what did he mean when he said that, that, that I have deeper connections with him than you do, Hung Shur? She said, I wasn't talking. But he told me, he said, your mother is actually Yan Fun Bini. How do Yan Fun you will Bini Gong Shen? She has deeper connections with me than you do, even, she said. He said about her and then he invited her to the city of 10,000 Buddhas to celebrate her 50th birthday and she came and he said I want all of at lunchtime I want all of you to pay attention this is a first in Buddhist history in America the first time a left home person's mother has celebrated her birthday at a monastery and we're all going well oh, that's amazing right and he said and now Hung Shur's mother is going to speak Dharma for all of us and I'm going like, oh, no. <laughs> my mother said, microphone, please. <laughs> she took the microphone. And immediately she said, I want to say to all of you monks and nuns here at the city of 10,000 Buddhas that you are falling down on your job, she said. And I'm like, gulp. No. My mother is scolding all of them. She said, you need to write letters to your parents regularly. My son should do it first. He said, if you don't tell your parents how you are doing in your cultivation, how are they ever going to wake up? 
and understand what you're doing and the value of what your teacher has been trying to teach you all these years. And Master Law's like, me? You know, and I'm like, hmm. everybody says, wow, I'm sure his mom is really. She said, I want you to take them across. And if you don't communicate, stay in communication with them, you never will. So sure enough, you know, that was my mother's uh, first opportunity to speak Dharma, which other opportunities came, you know. So pretty amazing. That's Master Hua's light, his ability to touch people in their hearts by what? By removing the coverings of his nature. That's the theory of cultivation is we don't get anything. We don't, you know, uh, nothing changes except we get rid of what covers us over. All right, so next week, bodhisattvas send out light. Now, I'm going to take the next few minutes and put something on the screen that I found disturbing, and it's appropriate uh, in the context of what I've been saying. Uh, people have been sending me articles and clippings like this one, which I'll pop up on the screen here. And this is the voucher. It says, Shenhua Shangren, Yu Yan Chengzhen, Shi Ji Bingdu Guoran Chu Xian. Master Shenhua's uh, prediction has come true. This is, <coughs> in fact, what has appeared is the, uh, the epidemic that will end the, end the eon. Right? This is an epochal epidemic. And the article it has Scherfu's picture, and the article goes on to say that Master Xuanhua predicted that the coronavirus was going to kill half of humanity. Now, I'm just to prevent, so people don't take a, those who haven't seen it, don't make a screen capture and then see it. Um, I'm just going to cut that back, but say that there are certain people who lack wisdom, unscrupulous people, who make unfounded claims about Master Xuanhua, the result being an increase in fear and panic and terror it's misinformation, and it needs to stop. Master Xuanhua never made a prediction about the coronavirus. And if he knew that somebody, maybe with the best of intentions, wanting to be a good disciple and publicize Master Hua, put words that he spoke at a different time into the current situation, and got the opposite effect. If he knew that anybody who called themselves a disciple was doing this, he would roast them and lower their ears. He would, he would uh, scold them and say, this is called wei kong shi jie bu lan, right? This is called qi shi hai shu. This is someone who is fear-mongering of the worst kind who is causing public unrest and potential panic, don't do it. Here's another one. You ready for this one? Somebody drew Master Hua's picture. More vicious than AIDS, the new pneumonia, Xuan Hua Shangren. This is somebody who actually put their name down, Sun Guosun. And if anyone knows who Sun is, decided to talk about it here. Tell them to stop putting words in Master Hua's mouth and commissioning somebody to draw a halo around his head and make him a what? A doomsday prophet. Because doomsday prophets, when their prophecies fail, become laughing stocks and they become sources of ridicule and they get left behind and forgotten. America has had numerous 
doomsday prophets who come along. Usually it's connected to the Bible, but not always, right? And they make their prediction and they shake the dice for the last time because it's either, once you do that, once you name the prediction, it's either true or false and your reputation either wins or loses. They always lose and they get forgotten, tossed in the dust of history and made a joke, right? We don't want that to happen to our teacher because of certain irresponsible individuals who mislead us and confuse people by claiming that Master Hua said these things about the current situation. He did not. He did not. And it's irresponsible and harmful to make that claim on his behalf. Potentially, the Chinese government could say, ah, oh, anyone who pins the coronavirus on any Buddhist teacher is going to jail. And once they're found out, you know, and I would agree, this is not helpful to make misleading claims about any teacher when it's false, no matter your motive. Oh, well, Master Xuanhua did say that, you know, not about this event. Don't publicize it. You are not helping your teacher. You're not helping the poor individuals who are suffering grievously from having a disease emerge in their country. America has had multiple diseases emerge in our country, and it's suffering when it happens. Don't make it worse with irresponsible claims that you are not responsible for. I was present when Master Xuanhua talked about AIDS, and it was, it was given in the context of the Uh, disasters that occur at the end of the eon, which is from the Buddha, not from Master Shen Hua, right? There's a disaster of water, floods. There's a disaster of winds, typhoons. There's a disaster of fire. We have had lots of fires. The Buddha said, these are natural phenomena when nature gets out of balance at the end, at, at ending times. Often, it's because people are not doing their part. But it's, quote, natural, just the way in the sutra today, nature responded to the goodness of the bodhisattva about to speak the Dharma with earthquakes and happiness and music and all. Likewise, when humanity goes the other way and is not fulfilling its job, nature responds. Okay, is that now? I certainly don't see that. I can't say that. That's not my job. Master Hua would never speak words that resulted in people feeling frightened, right? Make them feel panicky. To say and that, look, here's the third one. New pneumonia, over half of the human population in the world is going to perish. Master Hua did not say that. And it says down below, welcome to print this, reprint this for free. And explain it, Bunga Wuliang, infinite merit to disturb people's well being and claim that half of them are going to die. Sorry, that's irresponsible. That's not your place as a Buddhist, even if you knew it were true, right? Oh, yeah, but we want everybody to recite the Dabe Jo, not through terror. This is actually being a terrorist in the name of the Dharma. Not a good idea. And whoever is sending this, whoever Sun Guasan is, stop. And if you know who this person is, have them contact me and I will tell them why they must stop. And if they don't, we want to know who it is. We're going to expose them and say, you must stop. This is not a joking matter. In, the Chinese don't consider this a joke. They are trying hard in a difficult situation to keep people calm so they can get through it without damage, without further harm. It's a terrible situation, right? If it was happening in Buffalo, if it was happening in Lexington, if it was happening in Spokane, we would be trying very hard to get people to calm and do the important things to get through the disaster. 
right? So <clears throat> we are not interested in doing anything whatsoever to make it harder for the Chinese authorities to bring the population through with minimum harm, right? So whoever this is, you are truly accomplishing maybe something you don't understand. You are increasing the difficulty of the, the, the virus. And I guarantee you don't know what Master Hua said or when he said it or what it was about. It was not about the current coronavirus. And you should be ashamed of yourself for promoting knowledge that you don't have in the name of a virtuous monk whose dharma was there to get people to end suffering. Okay? I think you get my drift. But this is really important that we stop this nonsense, borrowing Master Hua's name to terrorize people. Not your responsibility, not your right to do that. So I think that's important that we, we get clear about that. All righty. So uh, difficult situation. And by all the accounts that we've heard, um, we're the peak of the coronavirus outbreak is close. They think that it'll be a number of weeks of where it gets worse and then it goes away. And this will be in the rearview mirror. And the Chinese, in a, in a, what do you say, looking for the silver lining, having gone through this difficult situation, locking themselves in, in their homes for weeks, how boring, how terrible that is for the mind, will emerge stronger for having had this community experience. And it's a terrible way to, to uh, learn, you know, uh, what it's like to have to talk to your kids, <laughs> how, what it's like to have to get together with your spouse, what it's like to read the books that are on your shelf that you haven't read because you were too busy making money, you know, too busy getting ahead. What do you have to do? You have, maybe you picked up a calligraphy brush and started to do characters. Maybe you learn to meditate. I bet there's going to be some great meditators coming out of this experience because why? They had to look at their own resources. They couldn't run out and, you know, earn a lot of money, which is what people do when they're young, right? So maybe they were home with their parents. Maybe they have a whole new relationship with board games, you know, uh, certainly WeChat got used to the max during this time. But uh, I think in the long run, not to say it was a good experience, but one of the, the benefits of having gone through it is a new strength. We made it. We made it through together. And it was horrifying, but we made it through. And uh, what's America's health report? Um, the... Uh, Center for Disease Control released findings that said by 2030, half of Americans are going to be obese. And 25% of Americans are going to be seriously obese. That the American diet, as currently practiced, is poisoning us and making us uh, unhealthy. Right? So... Maybe, maybe these experiences are, you know, they unify the nation. The Chinese are going to come out stronger. It just has in their own resources. Americans seem to be getting softer, weaker. So I don't know. Certainly, uh, uh, we could all benefit by, and I'm going to do a, uh, going to do a, a brazen advertisement for something that I think is valuable. There's a movie uh, available now on YouTube called The Game Changers. And I happen to like this movie a lot. Here it is, The Game Changers. And when John Robbins, bless his heart, released a, a movie back in the 80s called Diet for a New America, you can't find it anymore. Xin Shi Ji De Yin Shi in Chinese. This was in the 80s. It was made by Los Angeles's 
public television station for John Robbins, who wrote the book called Diet for America. Master Hua watched it, told us to translate it in the Chinese, and got 20 copies and put them on the desk at the Translation Institute, said, anyone who comes in, give them one. He said, this is good. Now, Diet for New America has pretty much gone the way of history. We remember it. It was a wonderful film. The current new effective one is called The Game Changers. It is available on YouTube, and I recommend it. Uh, it, it happens to agree with my philosophy on diet and health and performance. And there's, no, there's no, nothing spiritual about the Game Changers. It's about the effect of dietary change on athletic performance, particularly. And it includes a lot of heroes, um, such as, um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, our governor, Arnold Schwarzenegger, who uh, is one of the producers of the film. He is completely in favor of a plant-based diet, plant-based diet. I notice in the movie, the word vegetarian doesn't occur very often. And the word vegan doesn't occur very often. They pretty much put a red X through those two words. Plant-based is the word we use. And they have the uh, 13 members of the Tennessee Titans, the NFL football team, who uh, went from the basement to the playoffs when 13 members of the team switched to plant-based diet completely. Uh, Rick Esselstyn is in the film. Uh, talking to firefighters in Brooklyn, New York, and getting them to drop six pounds in one week each on the average, and to drop 100 points of, not 100, but uh, uh, what, the average was 40 points of blood pressure and cholesterol drops simply by eating one week of plant-based diet. Um, who else is in the film? Um, the uh, The... I wish I, I'd forgotten his name. Scott Urich, Scott Urich, who is a, is a long distance marathoner. Scott decides he's going to run the entire Appalachian Trail. I've walked pieces of the Appalachian Trail, usually miles, 10 miles at most. Scott starts in Georgia and runs the entire Appalachian Trail in 42 days. Pretty much inhuman, and it's the new record by a few hours, especially after he tears a ligament halfway. He continues to run and through the rain and over the mountains, he winds up at Mount Katahdin in Maine in 42 days, a couple thousand miles, eating vegetables, right? Plant-based diet, no meat in Scott Urich's diet whatsoever. Uh, the host of the film is a wonderful guy named James Wilkes, who is the mixed martial arts champion of the world. Uh, who teaches self-defense to the military. And he, in the process of the film, adopts a plant-based diet and performs at a level unimaginable before, simply by removing ingredients from his food and replacing all those ingredients with other ingredients that taste better and work better with the body. So among the, uh, the, the great discoveries in the film, is they do research on the bones of gladiators. And gladiators are considered to be the original fighting force. Back in the Roman days, Rome made an entertainment out of putting humans in, a, in, a, in an arena with wild animals and with each other to fight to the death. Now, if you're a professional fighter, of course, you want to be the strongest, right? They looked at the bones of the gladiators and discovered a huge amount of strontium. Strontium is present only in plants, not in meat. And all of the bone, they, they found 65 corpses in Turkey, Ephesus, Turkey, of where the gladiators had been buried. And they borrowed some of their bones and did research all of the bones of the gladiators have high amounts of strontium, which is present only in vegetarian diets. They are, they had a name for them, which was barley and bean chewers. They ate barley and beans. 
That was their diet for the, the fiercest fighters in the world. So how interesting. So go check out on YouTube. It's also on Netflix if anybody has a subscription. But on YouTube, you can find The Game Changers. I believe one of the, uh, the leading lights behind the film was James Cameron, the filmmaker of, um, 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 what was it? Uh, Avatar and what else? Um, my Heart Will Go On. The, the, the shipwreck. Titanic. Everybody. Titanic, correct. Thank you. See, I'm just not into my romantic. Titanic. Yeah, he used to make it. Okay, our time is up. I've run over. I would like to dedicate merit now and then invite Jin Chuan or Jin Hu or Jin Wei or Jin Fu sure to uh, give the announcements to the folks there in Berkeley. We will bow here. You can bow there. And we'll see you next week um, for the sending out of light by bodhisattvas into different dharma realms. How cool is that? Um, I've got to reopen my word processor here. I just closed it by mistake. Here we go. Dedication of merit is coming up next. And I think wherever you would like to send it, it would be welcome. But I know there's one place where we could really use more light and that's wherever people are suffering from diseases my emerald carbon fiber 12 street announcements for the monastery. We're still um, having our regular programs. I believe tomorrow we'll have the, the Theravada nuns coming in the evening. Monday, Amelia Borelli. Uh, Wednesday, we'll have the um, Stephen Tainer's class. Thursday, East Bay Insight Meditation. Friday, Marty's going to be talking on the Abhatamsaka Sutra. And Saturday, we have Reverend Hong Shur lecturing. Um, similar today, we're also not having the regular um, Saturday morning Dharma assembly and afternoon lunch because kind of all the, the things going on. So we decided to uh, kind of let the monastery be a bit quiet so then people can stay at home or cultivate on your own. But I think after that, we're going we're gonna to kind of discuss as a monastery to see what we want to do for the Saturdays. So you can stay posted. Um, if you have any questions, you can call the monastery to figure out our schedule. We put an announcement on our website. Okay, I don't know if there's any questions or things I left out. Jing Fosher, anything? No?
No? Okay. Jing Wei Shui? No? Okay, so maybe we can roll bow to the Buddhas and... Or maybe Jing Wei Shui, if you could leave that. I'll put up the screen. Three times. 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 Three times.